Reading with your kids. Hola, Niha, Kunichiwa, Assalamu alaikum, Shalom, Mahaba, Moni Miliwanji, Namaste, Jambo, Bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jedley, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so very delighted and so very honored that you are joining us in our mission to help families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to subscribe to the show on the iHeartRadio app, on Amazon Music, Spotify, Stitcher Radio, Google Podcasts, wherever you find your podcast. Our guest today is the Space Gal, Emily Calandrelli. She is returning to the show to celebrate Reach for the Stars. Before we invite Emily back into the studio, we want to invite you to reach out to us and connect with us on social media. So many places to do it. Facebook.com slash reading with your kids. Are you on Instagram? We are. It's at reading with your kids. We have a great Pinterest page, reading with your kids. And of course, on Twitter, we are at Jedly Magic, just to make it difficult. And... Pretty soon, we're going to be on TikTok. We don't know what we're going to be doing on TikTok, and we need your help. So we'd like to invite you to go to our website, readingwithyourkids.com. When you go there, please do sign up for our free newsletter. And also, use the contact button at the top of the page to let us know what you think we should be doing on TikTok. You can also use that contact button to let us know what we're doing well on the show. Let us know what we can do better. And let us know who you would like to hear on the show. Joining us right now from beautiful Southern California, our guest is returning to the show to celebrate the release of her beautiful new picture book. It's called Reach for the Stars and is written by our guest, the space gal, Emily Calandrelli. Hey, Emily, welcome back. Hey, thank you so much for having me back. I'm really excited to have you back. What a beautiful cover. I have the cover Mm -hmm. right in front of me. The illustration is absolutely beautiful. Tell us all about Reach for the Stars, please. Oh, my goodness. So this was a book. This is my very first picture book, and it's a book that I wrote a few months after my daughter was born. Um, And so I had my first child, my daughter, two years ago. Uh, She just turned two. And after she was born, I was going through all of these really intense postpartum emotions where I was just imagining her growing up. And I was dreaming of all of the things that I wanted her to be able to reach for throughout her life. Because as a, as a child is born, the, one of the first things that they do is reach for things. Mm. That's the one like sort of instinctual thing that they uh, know how to how to do. So they, they reach for um, their mom's thumb or they reach for the mobile above their crib and they start to reach for other things like food and bottles and bigger things as they go throughout life. And I just imagined all of the different things that I wanted her to reach for at every stage of her life and all of the things that I wanted to teach her at each of those stages of her life. And so I just put that all in a book <laughs> and that became Reach for the Stars. Wow. Was it a challenge for you writing? Because you've obviously you've written lots. You've written TV. You've written uh, the Adelaide Adelaide series of middle grade books. This is a picture book and you're not talking about science. Well, there's some science there, but you're talking more about emotions. Right. Exactly. And I think that that creative writing is something that I've always loved. That was always something that, um, I was good at growing up and I loved practicing growing up. Um, and I didn't have too much of a chance to kind of exercise those muscles while as an engineering student, um, throughout my eight years of engineering classes. And then after I got out, I started writing again and that was more on blogs and social media. And that evolved to technical writing where I was a journalist for TechCrunch and I was covering the space industry. And then later it became more public speaking, which clearly involves a lot of um, creative writing there. And then the Ada Lay series. And so I think um, over the last decade of my career, I've kind of practiced my creative writing in very different ways. And this was just a fun new challenge of figuring out um, 
how to put these ideas to words that felt poetic, that felt like it had a good rhythm, that felt like something that I would like to read to my own child. Because as I, I mean, my daughter's two now, so I've read many a book to her and some are more fun to read to her than others. And I wanted to be able to get that cadence of something that is fun for the adult to read to a child, but also convey that emotional message that I was feeling at the time. Mm. How difficult was it for you to put these, you know, it's, it's kind of autobiographical in, in that you're not writing about what happened to you. You're kind of writing about what you hope to happen. Yes. Oh my gosh. If anybody is ever thinking of writing a book where in the end of the book, their own child goes off to college and has nothing else to learn from the adult, um, I don't recommend it because it is (laughs) heart wrenching. um, Because as you read the book, it goes through the stages of the child being an infant, then the the child being a toddler, and then a young kid, and then a teenager, and then a high school student, and then the child gets old enough to have their own adventures and they move away. Um, And we don't really state how, why they're moving away. It could be for their job or for college or whatever it is, but there's a few lines in there that I simply cannot read (laughs) out loud, even though I wrote them myself. I cannot read them out loud without crying myself because it's, it's, it's so, I think it strikes those emotional chords that all parents feel Um, when they're watching their kid grow up, because on one stage, on one hand, you're kind of mourning the loss of the last stage. You're mourning the loss of the infant while you're welcoming this new personality that comes with a toddler, which is beautiful and in many ways way more fun and enjoyable because you're getting to meet your kid, but you're still mourning the loss of the previous stage. And then at the very end, You're mourning the loss of all of the stages that came before. You're mourning the loss of the infant and the toddler and the teenager and every single person that you fell in love with walks out the door all at one time. (laughs) And it's hard to even explain it without tearing up, but that's like the the emotion that I convey in the book. Yeah. You know, I I think I first became aware of that when my son was having a very tough, difficult time going through middle school. And I remember there was one particular day where uh, we we had it out, and I don't know if we were angry or just it was he was upset and helped him through it. And I looked at a picture of me and him at an apple orchard when he was a toddler, and I'm like, I miss that dude. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I miss that dude. I know. Oh, it's it, like it gets so emotional because it because you start off with things being very simple. Um, and hard, it's hard in its own way, but as they grow up, it gets more complex, but also more beautiful. And it's, I think the book like really helps you understand all of those emotions that you're going through. It kind of like, for me, it puts words to those emotions, which was helpful for me to kind of digest them and (laughs) figure out like, I'm a new parent. I'm learning all of these new things. I'm feeling all of these new things. Like, why am I feeling so at the same time elated at this new child, but also like my heart is breaking at the same time. And so I think that each chapter kind of goes through (laughs) those simultaneous emotions of joy and sorrow. Um, And, and also like touches on all of the things that you as the adult hope to teach them and pass on to them. Not just for me, like the life lessons, of course, but, For me, throughout each page of the book, I also infuse the science that I'm hoping to teach her. The um, when I want to teach her the words like universe. Um, When I want to teach her how the the sky is blue, why the moon creates the tides, and how the asteroids become our shooting stars. And it's a mix between the life lessons that we want every child to know as they go throughout their life, but also the fun things about the universe that inspires them to be curious to learn more. And I think that's what makes this book a little bit more unique is that I infuse that science that I'm personally so passionate about into every stage. Was it difficult for you 
to a, because you're a communicator and you're communicating in all these different mediums and people know the space gal and she knows how much she is and how much fun she has talking about science and engineering. Was it difficult for you, scary to also let people know that, hey, I got a lot of emotions here? Yeah, it, it is a little bit. I, I think that for me, especially when I first started out, because STEM is such a male dominated field, that was reflected in my social media following. When I look at the analytics of the people who follow me, five years ago or so, it was maybe 75% men who were following me because I was just the demographic of people who studied science mm -hmm. and engineering. Um, but then something really cool happened. Uh, when Emily's Wonder Lab came out, I had a rush of followers who were mostly moms who wanted to find creative ways to inspire their kids. And so all of a sudden, my demographic after Emily's Wonder Lab came out shifted from predominantly male to predominantly female. And most of it was driven by these moms who are just so wonderfully passionate about inspiring their kids. And that, I think, that change in demographic and the people who follow me helped me open up a little bit more, helped me talk about the side of motherhood and uh, what it felt like because it resonated with so many people that follow me for other reasons. And I was getting comments of uh, from other mothers who were talking about the same stuff. So it felt like I was helping to build this community of people who are passionate about getting kids curious about the world around them, but are also recognizing the challenges and the joy and the sorrow of motherhood at the same time. And it was this really fun community and really just like helpful community to be a part of. It felt really welcoming. And so I think after Emily's Wonder Lab came out, it gave me that safe space to be able to talk about these new things that I was feeling that may not have been like purely scientific. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we should remind folks that Emily's Wonderland at Wonder Lab is a great series on Netflix. And one of the things that was so unique about it is that Netflix made the decision to allow you to film that when you were nine months pregnant. Yes. Oh my gosh. It was, it was such a welcoming call from Netflix because I've had many of conversations with other networks who um, science networks where the audience is predominantly male because again, male dominated field, mm -hmm. they didn't necessarily want to pick a female led science show. And so when I got the call from Netflix that they did want a female led science show and not only did they want it, they were totally fine with me filming at nine months pregnant. I was so excited. I, I was so excited because this was just not the type of representation that I ever saw when I was a kid. When you saw someone who was pregnant, it was almost always about them being pregnant and being an expectant mother, and that was their whole identity. But in the show, we don't mention the pregnancy at all. I am v I'm nine months pregnant. I'm very obviously pregnant, but it just is. I just happen to be a pregnant person doing science on TV. And I think that very quietly that spoke volumes to the kids who are watching that you can be someone who wants to be a mother. You can be someone who wants to have a family and also love science and also have all of these other interests. And to be able to provide that representation to the next generation. It's something I'm really, really proud of. Yeah. You've had a unique experience where your daughter has spent most of her life in, in lockdown. Yeah. What was that? What were the, the, I always look, try to look at the bright side. Yeah. What were the challenges and also the, the gifts of, you know, being mm -hmm. a new mom during pandemic? Yeah, I mean, the beautiful side of it for me is that with my job, I travel so much. Um, when I'm in the heat of filming season, we are traveling sometimes every week, sometimes every other week for about two to three days a week. And so there are many nights that I'm not there for the morning routine or the evening routine. And during the pandemic, all of that shut down. And so for I don't know, 14 months of her life, 16 months of her life, I was here every single day for every single morning routine and every single evening routine. And it was just 
it was really, really wonderful to be able to see my first child grow every single day and be there for all of the milestones along the way. That was really wonderful. Um, the downside of it is that we don't live near family. Both my husband and I have moved away from our homes. And so we have family back in Missouri, where his family is from, and back in West Virginia, where my family is from. And because of the pandemic, we just haven't been able to see the, uh, her grandparents very often or her aunts and uncles very often at all. So that's been pretty hard. And I'm really looking forward to um, when kids can get their vaccine so that we can be a little bit more lenient uh, on that front and have her see a lot more family a lot more often. Yeah. I, as, a, as a parent, and, and, and I, we, I remember when the, when it, when the pandemic first happened and, and maybe four or five months in, I was getting pitches from these authors who just wrote a book about the pandemic. And I'm thinking to myself, mm -hmm. it's, it's, we're just about over. I don't know if this book's going to be relevant. I realize now that we're going to be talking about this with our kids for a long time. How yeah. how do you think um, families, moms can uh, and dads can talk to their kids about what we went through and, and about the future without terrifying them, without terrifying ourselves? Yeah, I mean, I think you just, you humanize it. You talk about the little decisions that, you had to make that kept your family safe, the little decisions that kind of changed your life in the process. And we're all going through this really weird thing together. And so in many ways, there is that togetherness aspect of it all because we're all going through something that's challenging and we have this shared experience. There are not that many times throughout life that we all have a shared experience across states and cultures and religions and identities and all of that. And so that's kind of a nice thing to be able to have that intersectional similarity um, for everybody. But I, I think you just, you talk a lot about the things that you had to do to survive this challenging time. And I think it's also really important to note that, you know, some people are having it harder than others. Um, that's going to be something that I want to make sure that I teach my daughter is that we are growing up in a very privileged family. She is going to have all of the resources that she needs to succeed in the best way that she can. And not all kids are going to be able to have that. And I think it's going to be a constant challenge to be able to remind her about that and have that be something that is just inherently known in her life so that when she gets older, she understands the privileges that she has so that she is able to leverage those privileges to help other kids um, who weren't afforded those same opportunities. Yeah. You know, along the same lines, you know, you, you talk about, you know, reach for the stars. You, you're, you're imagining all these different conversations that you want for your daughter and, and the, the, the future that you're hoping for your daughter. I'm, I'm sure one of those hopes is that, you know, all those things that separate us, the culture, the identities, the politics, that somehow we're able to knock down those barriers so that we can come together. As somebody who is really knowledgeable in the area of, of STEM and science, uh, can you imagine that happening? Is there hope that we're going to be able to overcome these differences and, and make the world a more equitable place? Yeah, I think there definitely is. I think kids, um, more so than adults, have greater empathy for others. And I think empathy is the key to be able to um, have those intersectional conversations about things that, um, based on identity alone, we may not agree on. Um, but empathy and understanding where the other person is coming from so that we can understand why they have chosen to believe the things that they believe and perhaps try to speak to them in a way that actually speaks to their values rather than speaking to them in a way that speaks to our values, which is usually a big communication error that we make when we have these tough conversations with people we love about things we disagree on. Um, we try to impose our own values on somebody else. I think it's really, really important to have empathy 
and understand why the person makes the decisions that they're making because usually people are making decisions because they love their family, because they want to protect their family, um, based on the shared interests that a lot of us have. Um, and I think kids are really, really much better at it, kind of employing empathy than adults. So I have um, optimism on that front. Yeah, I want to share your optimism. I, I know a lot of people who make some really what I think are dumb decisions, but I don't know that they're making it from a place, uh, from a bad place. It's, you know, they're making it because they think, oh, this is going to be best for my family. And I, I'm, I'm worried and I'm scared. And this is why I'm doing this. Yeah, I think fear is mm -hmm. um, the origin of a lot of bad decisions. Yeah. And so trying to find where that fear lies and try to help people um, kind of understand their own fears can be really useful. Uh, I think there's also different categories of people. Maybe there are some people who may never change their minds no matter what you do, even if you're the most empathetic person in the world. But then there are some people who may be on the border, um, mm -hmm. and those are the types of people that I think empathy can go a long way with. Yeah. Well, we know that reading with our kids helps them develop that sense of empathy, helps them understand that people have different perspectives, and we've talked about that benefit. But I want to just ask you, as a parent who's reading a lot to your daughter, what are the benefits that you are experiencing reading with your kids? Oh, my gosh. I mean, it, it just in the vocabulary alone, because um, we'll know uh, kids are always just so much smarter than we give them credit for. Um, giving a professional example, there were many times where we pitched a show like Emily's Wonder Lab, and it wasn't picked up because the networks thought that it was too advanced for kids to watch. It had too many sciencey words. Um but we learned with the success of Emily's Wonder Lab that that wasn't the case, that so many kids love learning about the messiness that is science. They don't want you to dumb it down for them. They want you to bring them along for the ride. And as long as you can very creatively explain complex things in a simple way that you where you don't lose them, then they will enjoy the content. With my own daughter, reading gives her this vast vocabulary where we'll read something that we just we think that, you know, we're just reading to her to get her to bedtime. And then the next day, she'll say a word that we didn't realize that she understood. Um, I, we're reading Halloween books now, and we uh, were out walking through our neighborhood looking at Halloween decorations, and she pointed to something, and she said, skeleton. And we didn't even realize that she knew that word. And so I think that they're retaining a lot more than we think. And it just has to be this consistent process where we're just constantly um, bringing up this vocabulary and pointing out new words and objects because that, that, that knowledge that grows over time. Yeah. And are you having fun reading with your kids? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's one of my favorite activities because you know that they enjoy it and it's fun to be able to do something that they enjoy, to be able to see that kind of bolt of inspiration happen where they point to a page and they know something that's on that page. It's just really fun to be able to witness that um, understanding in real time. And yeah, so for me, it's it's being able to watch those light bulbs go off in my daughter, and that is the, the most fun part. Yeah. And, and just one last question before you go. Have you taken the time to think? Now, obviously, your, your series, your, your television series, your, your middle grade novels, they've been inspiring, and families have been enjoying those together. But people are going to enjoy Reach for the Stars a little bit differently, I think. I think a lot of moms and dads, because I know I cried a lot when I read to my kids, they're going <laughs> to be reading this book, and they're going to – shed a tear or two. Uh, have, has that sunk in to understand that you're going to be, uh, you're going to be turning on the waterworks in a lot of families? Yeah. I mean, I, I think those are the types of books that I enjoy the most because they convey sometimes these emotions that I want to express to my daughter and I may not have the words currently to be able to do that. And so I'm hoping that I was able to put those emotions to words for some parents out there and that it resonates with some people. I think this is the type of book that 
simultaneously makes for a great gift for a new parent, but also makes for a great graduation gift yeah. because it has that inspiration that you hope to give to those kids who are leaving the house for the first time, who are off to make their own lives and have their own adventures and all of that. And so I'm, I'm hoping that it has that feel for other families as well. Yeah. Emily, please tell everybody where they can go to find out more about Reach for the Stars and find out more about you. Yeah. So my website is thespacegal.com. Reach for the Stars is going to be available anywhere. Books are sold on bookshop.org and Amazon and Barnes & Noble and your local bookstore, of course. And uh, I'm everywhere on social media at The Space Gal. We've had a wonderful time speaking about Reach for the Stars, the latest book from our guest, The Space Gal, Emily Calandrelli. Hey, Emily, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. Please be sure to join us for the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. We're really excited to welcome a Boston resident, one of my neighbors, Lisa Stringfellow, to the show. She's here to celebrate A Comb of Wishes. It's her debut middle grade book. You don't want to miss it. Hey, authors, please be sure to visit readingwithyourkids.com. Click on the Authors Click Here button at the top of the page to find out how you can be a guest on the show, to find out how you can submit your book to our Certified Great Read panel, and also to find out about our promotional packages. Learn all about it at readingwithyourkids.com, clicking on that Authors Click Here button at the top of the page. I want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Of course, we want to start by thanking our guest, the Space Gal, Emily Calandrelli. Please be sure to check out Reach for the Stars. Also want to thank my team, Alejandra Jarity, Fatima Khan, Rory Grady, Skylar Strauss. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives to me. Most of all, we all want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of The Reading With Your Kids Podcast.